In the last video lecture we understood what are tag or label the immunoassays. We also discussed two important tags, radioisotopes and enzymes. The technique in which a radioisotope is used as a tag or label, that is, radioisotope is covalently linked to antigen or antibody for the detection of antigen-antibody complex, is known as radioimmunoassay. Radioimmunoassay was developed in 1959 by endocrinologist Rosalind Yallo and Solomon Burson to measure the circulating levels of important hormone insulin. In 1977, Rosalind Yallo was awarded Nobel Prize for Medicine for the development of radioimmunoassay for peptide hormones. Solomon Burson could not share the award because of his untimely death in 1972. In radioimmunoassay, the antigens, or antibodies, are labeled with radioisotopes. We know that radioisotopes emit radiations. These radiations can be detected and measured using specialized instruments such as gamma counter. Most popular radioisotope used as a tag is iodine-125. Let's first understand the basic principle of this assay. Radioimmunoassay determines the concentration of an antigen in a sample based on the competitive binding between radiolabelt and unlabeled antigen for its specific high affinity antibody. Suppose this is a microtiter well. A fixed or constant amount of antibodies specific to our test antigen is immobilized in this well. Say, two antibodies. Next, we add specific radio labeled antigens to this well. And the amount of these antigens is such that they saturate all the antigen binding sites present in the well. This well is rinsed to remove the unbound radio-labeled antigens. At this point, if we measure the radioactivity of the well, it will be maximum, say 100%. Now in a second microtiter well, again we take the same amount of immobilized antibody. But this time, we add unlabeled antigens along with the previous fixed amount of radio-labeled antigen. Note that antibodies present in the well has same affinity for both the labeled and unlabeled antigen, since both the antigens are same. Therefore, these antigens will compete with each other for the antigen binding sites. And now, some of the antigen binding sites will be occupied by the unlabeled antigen. Again, after binding takes place, the well is rinsed to remove any unbound antigens. If we now measure the radioactivity of this well, it will not be 100%. It will decrease because the unlabeled antigens have replaced some of the radio-labeled antigens. Decrease in radioactivity tells us that the antigen is present in the test sample. But, how to determine the concentration of this antigen? Suppose, we want to detect presence and quantity of an antigen in the patient's serum. We suspect that this patient's serum has the antigen of interest. To quantitate the antigen present in the patient's serum, first we need to obtain a standard curve. This standard curve is obtained by measuring the amount of radioactivity using fixed and excess concentration of radio-labeled antigen and varying known concentrations of the unlabeled antigen. Again note that both these radio-labeled and labeled antigens are same as the antigen we are going to detect and quantitate in the patient serum. Let's have a look at the basic steps involved in the generation of standard curve. We require three main components. An important point is that all these components 
and their quantity is known to us. First component is specific antibody to the test antigen. The quantity of this antibody being used is fixed. These antibodies are immobilized in microtiter wells. Second component is the radio labeled antigen. Estric symbol used in this designation tells that the antigen is labeled. The quantity of radio labeled antigen is again fixed. This quantity is enough to saturate all the antigen binding sites in the well. Third component is the unlabeled antigen. We will use increasing varying concentrations of unlabeled antigen. First, we take a microtiter plate. To keep this illustration simple, we are showing only five microtiter wells. In each well we will immobilize fixed amount of antibodies, specific to the test antigen. Let's say three antibodies are fixed in each microtiter well. Thus, concentration of antibody is constant in all these wells. Now, we add fixed amount of radio-labeled antigen to the first well. This amount of radio-labeled antigen is enough to saturate all the antigen binding sites in the microtiter well. We will rinse the well to remove any unbound antigens. If we measure the radioactivity of this well, it will be maximum. Let's say 100%. This is our control well. Next, we will add same fixed amount of radio labeled antigen in all other wells too. But along with this, we will add unlabeled antigen in increasing varying concentrations. That means to each well, fixed amount of radio labeled antigen and increasing amount of unlabeled antigen is added. What will happen now? As we said before, antibodies present in the wells cannot distinguish between radio labeled and unlabeled antigens. Thus, in each case, the unlabeled antigen will compete with the radio labeled antigen for the antigen binding sites. It is important to note that, as the concentration of unlabeled antigen increases, it occupies more antigen binding sites. Now, in each well there will be bound as well as unbound antigens. In the next step, we will separate the unbound antigens by rinsing the wells and measure the radioactivity in each well by gamma counter. Radioactivity will decrease in each well, with increasing amount of unlabeled antigen. This is because, now some of the antigen binding sites have been occupied by unlabeled antigens. And there is less number of bound radio-labeled antigens in each of these wells, as compared to the control well. At the end of this procedure, we have value of radioactivity for each well. Also we know, the concentration of the unlabeled antigen added in each well. Let's now plot a standard curve. In this graph, y-axis represents the radioactivity measured for each well. And x-axis represents the concentration of the unlabeled antigen. As the concentration of unlabeled antigen increases, the value of radioactivity decreases. So, this is our standard curve. Note that we are showing only the linear portion of the curve. Let's now quantitate the antigen in the patient's serum. We will take same quantity of immobilized antibodies in a microtiter well, as we used in the standard curve. To this well, we will add the fixed amount of radio labeled antigen. Again this amount is same, as we used in standard curve. And along with this, we will add suspension of patient's serum. 
The antigens present in the patient's serum will compete with radial-abled antigens for antigen binding sites in the well. Well is rinsed to remove unbound antigens, and radioactivity is measured. Let's suppose radioactivity measured for this well is 35%. Decrease in radioactivity indicates the presence of antigen in the patient's serum. We will extrapolate this value of radioactivity in the standard curve. Thus, we will get to know the quantity of antigen present in the patient's serum. Radioimmunoassay is mainly used to detect hormones and to diagnose allergies. These tests are now replaced by more sensitive and cost-effective methods. The main disadvantage of using radioimmunoassay is the hazard to the professional due to exposure to radioactive. Most of the radioisotopes have short shelf life. This technique is also expensive as it requires specialized equipment. Moreover, it is a time-consuming technique. That's all in today's video lecture. In next video we will study enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. Thank you for watching.